All right. Looks like it's recording now. All right. So I picked um, Starsky Robotics as a as a subject because they basically shut down their doors last week and closed out as a startup. <clears throat> and if you're not familiar with what Starsky Starsky Robotics is, I put a link in the in the page to kind of like you know to this medium article that Stefan the head of Starsky Robotics wrote a while back, not long ago. So March 19th, I guess he, he is when he wrote it. Um, they, they're basically an automation, uh, robotics automation company, and they wanted to do autonomous driving for semi tractor trailer trucks. And, um, it's hard to explain how big of a deal this was in the United States because there's a good 30% of the people in the United States that their, their livelihood is in some way shape, like connected to or influenced by the shipping industry. So you're either a truck driver or you work in a warehouse or somewhere along the supply chain where you're moving things from point A to point B. And it's one of those, it's one of those things where this is a massive potential disruptor for, you know, the entire industry. And, and if these guys had been successful, they could have potentially, you know, made about 20, 15 to 20% of the people in the United States unemployed. And their failure is kind of a reflection of a lot of different things, but also a really good demonstration of you know, a lot of different business concepts that, that fall, that have fall kind of like fallen into effect as a result of the, like the AI bubble that's starting to burst now. So on one end of the, one end of the spectrum, you got Star City Robotics and on the other end of the spectrum, you got companies like Uber that are still going full blown and Tesla that are still going full blown. And on the surface, you know, Starsky should have been the one that kind of took off because their business expectations and their, you know, their backing was pretty good. And then the problem they're trying to solve was relatively straightforward. They stuck to a very simple problem going between point A to point B with a big rig truck where there's minimal turns, minimal traffic. They weren't even going to have their trucks change lanes. They were just going to sit behind people and go slow if they had to. And in the United States, we're full of highways that are like this, just just everywhere. You can go, you know, 600 kilometers in a couple hours because you get on a highway and you just go in a straight line for, you know, you know, at, you know, 100 miles an hour. Right. Because I have a bunch of Europeans. I'll Google what that is. 100 miles per hour. Miles per hour to KPH. Yeah, so that's like 100 miles an hour is like 160 kilometers per hour. So pretty fast. And you don't really have to worry because the roads are straight. They're relatively well maintained. And everybody's going that speed, so it's not a big deal. And so there was many road trips I took where I would get on the highway between Kansas City and Denver. And I-70, it's a 12-hour drive nonstop. So you can get in your car, you pull over for gas. Other than that, you can practically take your hands off the steering wheel and you just drive straight across the, the state of Kansas. And that's the kind of trip that like literally 12 hours straight of just driving at hundred miles an hour. So that's the kind of trip that these, these star robotics guys were planning on automating for truck drivers. And um, yeah. By all intents and purposes, they had a strong business case. They had a strong plan. They had strong technology. Um, so it didn't make any sense that they kind of failed. They even have a cool website, right? You can see this thing. There's, there's a, that was a good view of one of the highways in Kansas. Actually, it looks like Florida. But you can see how, like, flat and straight, and, and it goes on like that for, you know, the entire length of the continent. Look how straight that is. So it's not a particularly difficult con, you know, problem for them they were trying to solve here. 
So what did they what did they run into? And this guy makes a bunch of different cases as to what their problems were. And I'll skip most of the nonsense because you got to remember also that this guy, Stefan, if you've never been involved in a startup that's failing, it is emotionally traumatic, right? You're losing your job, you're losing your investment, and you're losing your legacy that you put your life and blood into for the last five years or whatever it is. So it's an incredibly painful process. And it, you end up doing a lot of introspection as to like, what did I do wrong or what could I have done better after the fact? And this article, you know, he tried to make it readable, but um, he tried to he tried to explain what what the what the failings were. What I will say is that there's not a lot of introspection on this. Nothing is attributed to the company itself or to him. It's no failings on his part or on his company's part, which in all failures, there's something that the team could have done better. Um, so there's a little lacks a little bit of introspection there, but he def definitely does a pretty good job of identifying the external factors that kind of led to his uh, his problem here. You know, and he does the standard, you know, my team is amazing. Everybody's great. We all love each other. Right. And then he starts talking about Moore's law, which is a really important concept, not just in, um, you know, AI, but also in, you know, transistors, right? It's like the processing power of a computer. And the problem with Moore's law is they've tried, one, it, it's a fallacy, right? Like most people think that like Moore's law and the processing powers of computers will continue to go on forever, which it won't. At some point, we'll hit a, hit a limit in physics that will say you're not allowed to, to fit any more transistors in a, in a square inch or whatever it is. Right. And you can see, you know, from 1971 to, you know, 2011, Moore's law has been pretty consistent. But what I would say is that it, what is really happening here is it hasn't quite the processing power still hasn't hit the S curve of technology, which basically says that at a certain point, it has to level off. We just haven't hit that with Moore's law yet. This is the, the first half of a, uh, of, a, of the S curve. Right. And you can see how it just, you know, the potential grows exponentially and it just is amazing. And for all intents and purposes, computers are still a relatively new technology in comparison to like bread. Right. So there's not a whole lot of innovation going on in bread nowadays, but its utilization is still pretty well established. And it followed this exact same pattern when it was first invented, too. Right. The first time somebody like ground up some grain and made it into bread, they were like, oh, my God, this is going to change the world. And it did. But point is, new, all new technologies basically follow the same pattern where they have what looks like Moore's, Moore's law. And then what they turned into is reality, right? This is, this is what happens basically with all technologies adoptions over time. And it's the bubble too, right? So AI has the same exact bubble that every other technology has on the planet. And yeah, it, it follows a consistent, consistent uh, shape. And you don't know how big or long the pattern is going to be, but it always ends up forming an S curve. Um, and, and it's also, he kind of explains here too, why a, a team of five to 15 engineers can see performance improvements. It's on par with a Tesla that has a hundred plus people working on the same exact problem. And that's because the, the gains exponentially drop off when you get to the top of the curve. And, and this is where AI is starting to get to is like in this area. Now there's been a distinct drop off in performance improvement, particularly in autonomous vehicles. They're starting to find the limitations of what these things can't do. And, and you've seen it in the news where, you know, some guy was letting his car run on autopilot and he got decapitated by, you know, a low hanging, you know, uh, you know, bridge or something, right? Because he just wasn't paying attention and the car didn't register it properly. Or, you know, some guy dressed in all white in a snowstorm gets run over by a truck, you know? So there's, there's these edge cases that arguably even a human being would have failed on, but that's not the point. The technology has reached its limit. And it's surprisingly close to the limit that, that uh, human beings have. But, more importantly is the concept of this S curve that, that occurs in all technologies. And anytime you start to build anything new, um, 
it's the same pattern, right? So you'll see this with software development and any kind of product development where um, it's really easy for in a project to do the first 95% of the project. It's always the last five meters of the project, the last 5% of the project of the initiative that requires about half the work, right? So when you feel like you're almost done, you're usually about halfway done is really the truth. And that is demonstrated also in this kind of thing here. Like in order for it to be usable, you have to get all the way over here. But like, you you know, you see all this success in the beginning and then what ends up happening is you're, 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 uh, you exponentially lose effectiveness or improvement over time. And, and you see this too with new teams, right? Like you come into a new situation and everything's a, a total um, train wreck. I was going to say something else, but everything's a train wreck. And then it's really easy to come in and straighten the bookshelves and vacuum the carpet and make everything look like it's vastly improved. But it's really difficult to go that last like bit and, and go from like, like if you're if you're showing 100 defects and then you take over the team and then it's really easy to get down to five defects. But getting rid of those last five defects is a lot of work. Everybody gets the low hanging fruit really, really quickly. And you see that in new executive teams, too. Like they'll come in and take over a company, make some dramatic operational improvements, major improvement in the business as a whole. And then it's like the last five meters is always the part where everybody gets stuck. So anyways, this is an important concept that you see in technology and innovation and projects. It's pretty much everywhere. Um, and I put a link to like the overall curve explanation, like the, the, it's not the product life cycle. It's the technology life cycle curve. Very similar. Uh, you see this S curve everywhere in, in nature. So that brings us to uh, this this graph that he's kind of generated here, where he's basically explaining um, where the technology of the S curve for autom autonomous driving vehicles lays in relation to the ability of human beings. And he's basically saying it's one of these two lines: either it's L one and the technology is already better than human beings. And then it's an economic problem of convincing the market to adopt the technology, right? Which then it, you get into the technology adoption curve, which is very similar to this. Or it's L2, where it basically says it's about equivalent and you have a very similar problem. Or it's L3, which I think he says he thinks it's most likely L3, which is that human beings are definitely still better than these things. But it's going to be virtually impossible for us to get there for, with the technology that we have with deep learning and, and, and all that. I don't necessarily agree with him. Actually, I think he said L2 is where we're at. There's there, it's on par. We're really what we're learning into is limits of physics and, and, um, and whatnot. Um, yeah, so he, he thinks basically that the bubble has started to run out on this. The technology is starting to get played out. The uh, All of the gold rush around AI, people are, reality is starting to set in on a lot of this stuff. And nobody at this point is starting to think, oh, you can take this technology and apply it to something like the stock market and make millions of dollars just by using a program that you work automatically. So um, then he gets into why they specifically did not um, survive. And this is where I found the article to get really, really fascinating. So he basically says they focused on safety was one of the main things. So um, this truck thing isn't the part. No one really likes safety, but they like features. This is the part that was interesting. So Starsky spent a lot of time and effort basically trying to prove that they had the safest autonomous vehicles on the road, primarily because, like I was saying earlier, they're trying to solve a relatively simple problem. And they built in the controls that basically said, don't take any risks whatsoever. I want you to be the most conservative, safest, you know, truck driver on the road. And the problem they found with that is that nobody cares, right? 
that people don't want to hear about how safe and how unlikely it is that you're going to have an accident because everybody says that. And it doesn't matter whether or not you spent two years on it or three months on it. You can basically say the same thing. And from a VC, so from a venture capitalist perspective or from the people who are paying you money to build this thing, they uh, they can't tell the difference between somebody who spent a lot of time and effort on the statistics and the analysis and the safety regulatory compliance and the people that are just kind of just playing lip service to it. And that's really the problem is really what he says here is that um, they couldn't. You know, they spent two and a half years and all this time and money on a, on the, the safety regulatory, you know, you know, technologies to make sure that they they truly do have the safest thing. And and that, you know, I really like this paragraph. Safety engineering is the process of highly documenting your product so that you know exactly the conditions under which it will fail and the severity of those failures and then measuring the frequency of those conditions such that you know the likelihood of your product will hurt people versus how many people you decided are acceptable to hurt and this and this this is really the key paragraph in the entire thing and this sums up a lot of industries and a lot of technologies where good safety engineering that's what it is right and people that are really like focused on quality and safety engineering understand that and that's why people like quality management get really, really frustrated with the fact that people aren't following their processes or they're not documenting things properly or et cetera, et cetera. And also part of the reason why data management kind of gets caught in the crosshairs between the safety and quality people in, in quality management and, and the operational folks and the business folks who frankly want to get this thing packed out the door and delivered so that we can get paid. And there's a balance that kind of gets struck between the two that it sounds to me, based on reading this article, Starsky wasn't able to meet. And I read a couple of other articles, too, of people analyzing Starsky. And some of them were very critical of their lack of focus on the market and lack of focus on what the, the customer was saying they wanted, right, versus, um, versus what they felt was important. So basically... Their criticism of Starsky was that the, the owner and that the, um, the company itself was trying to tell the market what it needed, right, instead of listening to the market on what they said they wanted. And he kind of addresses that here to a certain extent, saying that he focused on safety and really what the, what the market was telling them they wanted were features. We want autonomous lane changing. We want the, uh, you know, automatic detection of flats and failures and notification systems. And he was like, yeah, but I don't kill people when they do, right? So there was a little bit of a disconnect between Starsky and the rest of the business. Now, from a public safety standpoint, let's just take them at their word and say they genuinely are safer and better than everyone else, right? And I just I just epitomized what they hate, right? I, I basically said, yeah, sure, you're safe. Um, but so is everybody else. They're saying they're safe too. So prove it. Right. Um, but I'm honestly don't care that much. I'm not even going to bother to read through all your documentation that says you're safer. It's just a waste of my time, especially since you're already a failed company. Right. So it's one of those deals where it's kind of like, uh, nobody cares. Right. And that's kind of what, um, what his problem, it seems like he personally has, him and this company had a philosophical disagreement as far as what is important in the world, right? Um, if you read down, he even talks a little bit about the fact that, you know, you know, there's, there's a certain amount of trade-off of, you know, we expect there to be, you know, nobody wants to talk about the fact that 500 people get killed, uh, a, you know, or sorry, 4,000 people get killed a year by big trucking accidents in the United States, Right. It doesn't make any headlines that there's basically a small 9-11 or, or equivalent amount of deaths every year in the United States related to the trucking industry. Nobody talks about any of that because yeah. that is part of the price that as a society we've chosen to accept and tolerate. And it's not it's not even news anymore that somebody dies in a trucking accident. It happens so frequently. It's several times a day. Right. And he has a problem with that. Um and, you know, he says it right here, like, all this work on safety is invisible. Investors don't want to hear about it. They're interested in, 
you know, in venture capital companies are interested in a return on their investment as they should be, right? They're not in this for necessarily for, you know, improving society, even though that is a nice, you know, thing that they probably also enjoy. The prime, you don't do that by itself, rarely. You save that for, you know, retirement and after you, you know, are closing down your final days of life where you want your legacy to be at. But but as far as like investing goes, you have to make sure that you want to maximize profit on your investments. And, you know, safety doesn't get headlines. Good highways. Nobody notices the highways in the United States until you've been in a country where they don't have nice highways. Right. The people in the United States take this. Look at this thing. This is a beautiful highway. And everybody here just takes these things for granted. Now, you go to some place in uh, you know South America where it's like two lane roads everywhere. And there's, you know, guys with donkey carts in the way. And, and then all of a sudden you come back to the United States, you're like, God, I really, really love the fact that I can get on the highway and do 100 miles an hour in my sports car. Right. And you can, you know, there's no point in owning a Ferrari in a place like, you know, Colombia because everything's dirt roads. So anyways, point is, is that a lot of this stuff gets taken for granted and expected to be paid for by, you know, it's a like the pro- problem of the commons kind of thing where it's expected, right? And nobody wants to invest in uh, nobody wants to invest in highways or safety. Safety is expected. So having the best safety is kind of like saying, "Oh well, I've got the best, uh, you know, safety." Who cares? You're not supposed to kill people. That's nothing to brag about. So uh, what's next? So these guys, their venture capital kind of fell through back in November, basically. They needed $20 million in, in capital, basically, to keep the doors open for the next you know, couple of years while they try to land contracts um, for their trucks. So their business model consisted of essentially subcontracting from shipping companies so that they can move things around for their shipping companies at a lower cost and then keep the, keep the margin. And... Um, most of them didn't care. They, there's also other factors that played in here that he doesn't even talk about with the fact that the Teamsters uh, are actively politically campaigning to destroy this, right? The, the thought that you could take a robot and stick it on the road and take somebody's job from them is, is terrifying to unions. And unions, as a general rule, have been kind of anti-automation since the inception of unions, but this is a particularly difficult industry to break into. This is the Teamsters are notorious in the United States for controlling the market and managing the market to the benefit of the people that are members of their union, which is exactly what a union is supposed to do. But what that means is it ends up being a pretty big barrier to innovation and technology. And in the case of this guy, I'm not even sure how much he thought about that. Based on this article, it doesn't even sound like he factored in the fact that he was going to be making a lot of people potentially unemployed. And whenever you have that kind of situation in a business, you need to make sure that you factor that in and cut them in, right? If you want people to not sabotage your business model and sabotage your business, one of the ways that you kind of can improve the situation is you cut the union in in some way. And you make sure that there's a compensation associated with that to those people. So like a universal basic income or something along those lines. And it doesn't sound like that played a factor in uh, this guy. You'll, you'll hear that in the United States, Andy, Andrew Yang, and then uh, you know Elon Musk, and now Bernie Sanders, and um, even the Republican Party now is getting on board with the idea of a universal basic income, which fundamentally sounds like communism, but uh, it's not really. So if, if that thing had taken hold sooner, he probably would have gotten less resistance and less undermining from the unions and less undermining from the from the teamsters in general so the rest of the article basically is a little bit of a you know most of the article is is basically a sad um goodbye to his own company but uh which is understandable and he even you know he he loved you know he's talking about you know the fact that you know five to 10 years, this stuff will probably be legit. He still thinks it's a legitimate technology. It's going to happen. It's just a matter of time. But he, he, uh, he wants, you know, he feels like these 4,000 people a year who are dying in truck accidents don't have to die. 
And that's a decision that's basically being made. Um, and who knows who he's angry at or upset with about this, but he feels like, you know, the, as a society, we've chosen not to go down this path and that we're sacrificing those 40,000 people to the current economic, uh, you know, status quo. And maybe he's right, but it's irrelevant. It's his opinion. Um, Anybody have any comments or want to add anything? I just, I find this company fascinating. I thought that these guys, when I first learned about them, when they came out, I thought these guys were going to take over the world. So I'm a little shocked that they folded. Anybody familiar with them? No. All right. Even if they don't take off, somebody else will pick it up. There's still like dozens and dozens of autonomous vehicle technology stuff out there. In my forum on Facebook, you know, I see posts literally on a on a daily or weekly basis about some new startup that's doing autonomous vehicle. And it all varies from from like the very small warehouse autonomous vehicles that move boxes from point A to point B in a in a warehouse to these guys who are the large scale free packing. The autonomous ships are already on the ocean. They already exist. So the Starsky version in the ocean is already out there shipping. They track them via GPS and, and whatnot, but it's a simpler problem. You don't have to worry about roads and um, you know, the chances you run into things are a little bit less. All right. So on the flip side, the other example I have related to this is these guys. And I just found this article. This article came out today. And and that's because literally all I all I click all I searched for was autonomous startup, autonomous vehicle startup, and then just like grab the top article from April 3rd, right? That's it, just to demonstrate somewhat like how prevalent these companies are right now. And the fact that this technology is not exactly like it, it's not exactly groundbreaking anymore. Like they've been working on this stuff for 10 years. A lot of the stuff that they're writing this in is in is open source technologies. You can see demonstrations of the specific specifics around the neural nets on the um, on YouTube all over the place. Really what sets the different companies apart has to do with their business model of how they're planning on making money off of it. And then also the sensors that they have attached to their vehicle. So this company basically has, you know, they've got LIDAR, which is like laser, laser sensors basically to do, do it. And they've got, you know, vision cameras. They've got, you know, their, their truck is just covered in sensors and They've got a relatively small compartment space, and they're doing it in urban areas instead of rural, the way Starsky was. And they are um, delivering food in short distances, right? And they also have the benefit of being in a time when all of a sudden the idea of having contestless delivery is uh, incredibly you know, attractive to everybody in China, right? So all of a sudden there's a quarantine in China. There's no, you know, you're, you know, nobody wants to go to the grocery store anymore. So now they are getting their stuff delivered. And uh, this guy was already working on this problem in Hong Kong. And so he's he, seeing this gigantic demand from a lot of companies and places and people that would never have ordered from him. It had Corona not popped up. So, and, and I, every company calls themselves the Uber of whatever, right? There's a, there's a local startup called GoPuff that calls themselves the Uber of food delivery as well. But it's the same principle in all of them, right? Which is, you know, we're going to have somebody, you know, we're going to have, have this car go pull up to a grocery store. Somebody in the grocery store will load up the groceries into the car and then it'll deliver it to wherever it goes. And then the people there will unload it. And you always see a title like this, Thomas Driving Powered by Deep Learning. Yeah, true, but it's been like that for like 10 years now. So not new or innovative in any way. Um, 
the other thing too that they talk about in this article is just how crazy the driving is um in china in comparison to the united states which i thought was a little funny i've seen videos of india i can't imagine trying to put an autonomous vehicle on a road in india because it looks like the people there just have no regard whatsoever for each other's property or lives um i was in a cab one time in venezuela and i swear to god this guy he pulled between two cars there was two cars on either side of us and he went between them to try to get through an intersection and it scraped down the sides of both sides of the cab the whole way between these two cars. And I thought for sure the guys in the cars next to us were going to kill us. Uh, the cab driver was like, whatever, it doesn't matter. That's why nobody has you know, side view mirrors on their cars here. This is like one of the most insane things I've ever seen. So if you tried to program an autonomous vehicle to do something like that, it just would not work. Okay. So the point is, is that these startups are a dime a dozen. The, eventually, somebody will start to get a foothold. When they get a foothold, a larger business like a GE or somebody who's got a lot of capital to invest will, will probably buy them, make them a subsidiary, generalize their technology, their proven technology, and then, and then really start to like take over. So that's that. So there are some success stories out there. I think the failure of Starsky is primarily due to the specific industry he went after and his lack of, uh, you know, his lack of understanding of what is really important in a business. Um, any commentary on that? Anybody else want to talk about autonomous driving cars? I was kind of hoping we'd all have them by now. Uh, Keith, I like to always think about the uh, when elevators were first coming into fashion, there was an operator in every single elevator. And obviously the technology advanced that you didn't need someone there to close the door and pull the lever. And people at first were so afraid to get into elevators without an operator. But eventually now, like if I walked into an elevator and there was a, and there was an operator there, it would be the strangest thing in the world to me. And I think that's the same sort of adoption we're going to see with the driverless cars, you know, and um, I talked to my kids about it and they're like, yeah, that's the coolest thing ever. Like, let's, you know, you, you let, let the computer drive. And yet my my parents are like scared to death of the, the idea. But it, to me, it's just the same you know, path as the elevator. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I feel like I feel like the autonomous cars are the same kind of deal with as elevators. I, I think trains are are probably more along the lines of where it's oh, going. Yeah. Because, you know, the reality is a train is just a vertical, you know, it's just a, a horizontal version of an elevator, right? And you know, there's still conductors and stuff in trains and I don't know if you've ever been in a conductor's cabin for a train. Um, but it's it's a guy with a lever. <laughs> You know, he's got he's got literally nothing else to do in there. He pushes it forward and then he sets it to neutral and he might move it backwards if something really went wrong. <laughs> right. And they've made those things so, um, you know, so autonomous at this point that the only time there's really like train accidents anymore is because some conductor is ignoring the recommendations of the onboard computer systems. Or you're in a really old train that doesn't have any of that stuff and they just are like flooring it around some curve. But like if they if they stick within the re recommended guidelines, those things like virtually never fail. And I, I think there's been like two train accidents in the United States in the last like 10 years. One of them was here in Philadelphia and it was because some guy was, you know, flooring it around a curve in an urban area. He shouldn't have been doing it. And then the other one, I think, was in uh, Washington or whatnot, and it, and it was the exact same situation. There was actually one like two days ago in L.A., but the conductor oh, really? was – Yeah, he was using the train to uh, – he wanted to take out the hospital boat, and he was trying to use the train as a missile to take it out. Oh, so it was more like a terrorist act. It was – yeah, really yeah he was the conductor. Yeah. No, yeah, and it was – yeah, basically like a terrorist act. The guy was pretty – it's an interesting article, but he's kind of crazy. That's interesting. With everything else that's been going on, that piece of news didn't even register with me. I don't know how it came up in my feed. <laughs> my guess is that 
I mean, I've actively avoided the news for the last week. So I I have my one dashboard I look at for the news right now. That's it. This is it. Here, I'll show it to you guys. Here's my news. I look at this. That's it. Oh, look, we're over a million now. Great. Yeah, I think we're all using this one. Yeah. So this is this is the only thing I'm using for news right now. I don't I, I go out of my way not to read uh, any of the major news outlets because the only thing that really matters is the statistics because everything else is just talking. Um, but yeah, this is a good dashboard. So yeah, that's probably why I missed the that's why I missed the missile guy with the train. <laughs> I just put the link in the chat so people don't think I'm crazy. <laughs> no, I believe you. You know, the other thing, let's talk about this for a second, actually. This is a really cool dashboard. But one of the things that's really fascinating here is um, it's really not probably talked about much is just the fact that everybody's like, oh, it's so terrible in the United States. And I don't know that that's necessarily the case. I think that the United States has a really robust um, reporting system and infrastructure for hospitals. And there are, you know, federal regulatory requirements that hospitals report on certain things, especially during a pandemic. And so there's compliance within the United States around reporting that probably doesn't exist in a, in a place like Brazil, right? Brazil is only slightly smaller from a population standpoint than the United States. And like, you know, the data that we're, whoa, the data that we're getting out of Brazil is like, oh, look, we've got 8,000 cases in Brazil. Um, I don't believe it. I don't know what else to say, right? It's much more likely that they're on par with the United States, maybe slightly behind the curve on the United States, you know, but more likely scenario is that their infrastructure around the healthcare system, they don't have the reporting and compliance with reporting or the, um, you know, the infrastructure in place to track it at a state or a hospital by hospital basis. If you go into the United States and, and you look at the data here, right, you can see that they're, they're literally like every little county in the United States is, is reporting. So like if you go down to look at my area because it's particularly nasty right if you look at philadelphia right, so here is uh new york edison newark there we go there's philadelphia all right so all these dots are are the different different counties so burks pennsylvania i never even heard of burks it's like 20 minutes, you know, maybe half an hour away from me. I've never even heard of it. But they're reporting cases in on the on the public basis. Look at Montgomery County. That's where I live. 735 cases. And if you look at Philadelphia, it's, you know, 2,000 cases. So if you're to believe this data on a global level, you're basically saying that, like, the city of Philadelphia and its surrounding counties has as many cases as Brazil, which has 300 and that 300 million people in it. And the thought that, you know, well, people here are idiots. I will say that. I mean, there's still kids on my block playing basketball outside my house um, while all this is going on. But the thought that like the people here are in some way, you know, worse than the people in Brazil or vice versa is kind of like silly. People are people. There's going to be compliance with these kinds of orders and concerns. Or not. I think just the hospitals here are better at reporting their numbers than uh, than Brazil. Uh, it's not just the hospitals, Keith. Just I, I used to work at Quest Diagnostics, um, so whenever we got a result, uh, there's a whole list uh, that you have to report on immediately to the health department, and I'm sure COVID-19 is on that list. Oh, so great. every positive you get for HIV, even like chlamydia, hepatitis, all that stuff has to be is met is law. You have to report that out daily. So every testing lab has that requirement. That's good to know. So, yeah, I didn't know that. I assume there was some, I know there was a reporting framework and like, you know, expectations, but I didn't know who all fell into the compliance of that. But, you know, I, 
I, I doubt that same kind of, you know, rec- requirement is in Mexico, right? There's so much traffic between the United States and Mexico on a daily basis. Literally millions of people moving back and forth between the border between Mexico and the United States. And the thought that they only have, you know, 1,500 cases while we have, you know, 250,000 is absurd. I think the difference comes to the testing capabilities and um, yeah. those are totally different and disparate. Uh, so, uh, you know, the numbers you get from the US are as well highly underestimated. Uh, and yep. uh, uh, But uh, yeah, it's picking up, right, because the testing is going on. Uh, you know, if you compare, I don't know, Germany and, and, and France, the numbers are comparable the death rate is uh, totally different there uh, and it's because Germany does a, a very massive testing compared to France uh, so uh, so you have uh, you know totally different uh, statistics wow. uh, from these, these two countries right I didn't even I didn't even notice that disparity that's interesting so what is you know I mean I would think that that speaks to the ability of France to respond to severe cases as well Right. When there's a severe case in Germany, the healthcare is based and the response is probably better versus France. I'm guessing. Uh, well, uh, possibly, yes, uh, uh, that that uh, can be uh, uh, there. There is as well a difference in methodology, how uh, the deaths are uh, actually accounted COVID. for for COVID. Yeah. Uh, so Germany, for example, doesn't take into account those who are you know, uh, terminally ill or, or very old uh, and, uh, gotcha. and and get a, a, a by infection of COVID compared to, for example, Italy, where everyone is uh, labeled as a COVID death. No, that makes sense. So if you're already on your deathbed and you get COVID and you die, they don't count you. Whereas in Italy, if you died and somebody in your neighborhood had COVID, they might count you. Even if it yeah, was because possibly. you broke your leg, but I'm exaggerating. So, yeah, 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 basically. But but so so there are you know uh, I think the the numbers are highly misleading because we are not counting apples and apples. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. Which also you know explains the disparity in China. Everybody says, well, China's lying about their numbers, and it might be also just the fact that you know they're just like what we were just talking about their definition of what a case of covid is is different than what we define it as so the other thing too is the controls in place in china are pretty are pretty uh draconian like they're very strict and controlled and they're they're monitoring the cities incredibly closely what i suspect is going on in china is that as with every country is that you get into the countryside and there's there's people passing along and then they're going home and they're sick and they don't tell anyone and you know what I mean? So yeah, that the reported is probably way less than the actual in every country. Yeah, yeah, well, absolutely. I think Korea, South Korea, could be an exemplary case. I think they are testing a lot, uh, so uh, you know the numbers probably there are fairly accurate, but. Uh, uh... Yeah, I mean one of the one of the tried and true thing is test everyone, figure out who they are, and then take the required precautions with the people that are that are positive. And if you don't test appropriately and you don't know who is and isn't sick, you can't actually contain it. So yeah, South Korea has done a pretty good job of that. And you can see that from their numbers, right? I mean, confirmed 10,000 deaths, 174. Most of the people are recovering and they haven't been growing much. So, yeah, I haven't been reading the news. I just read this. And mostly just to yeah. see how bad it is in my area. And I think back to, you know, your comment about the, you know, very uh, nice granular dashboard for the US and and, and uh, nothing else anywhere. Uh, it's it's because it's quite difficult to, to get the data uh, from the other countries to the, this level of granularity, not that they don't exist. But uh, it would be a massive undertaking for John Hopkins to uh, to, to pull actually, that. Uh, you know, to pull that together because everything is on on national uh, national level, local language, 
local uh, local sites that would be quite difficult to uh, to to just import into this right the non-standardized reporting so it's probably you know what they easier. need you know what they need is a uh, a data engineering team and a data warehouse yep <laughs> at the world health organization they do indeed i did find a map for italy that was on par with the united states and it drilled into gosh i wish i had a bookmark bookmarked it but it basically was a um, province by province map of the cases of in italy but it was still only at the province by province level and one of the things that was really fascinating is everybody's talking about northern italy being infected and the cases in northern italy are where most of the most of the problems are at but the economic impact is in southern italy because of you know the fact that the southern italy is less developed from an industrial and economic standpoint so what they're running into is that even though that the deaths and the you know the medical emergency is happening primarily in northern italy southern italy is feeling more economic pain because of all this so they've started having problems with looting and protests and riots in southern italy so what you're seeing is these secondary impacts of a pandemic which are not necessarily healthcare related but they're economic related and they cause unrest and social discord so they're having this to fight this like dual battle in in italy where they're trying to balance health health concerns in the north and economic concerns in the south it's the same the same you know concern and problems are occurring pretty much in every country now um, but it's particularly interesting in italy because one it's just so so severe there in northern italy and it's such a disparity between the north and the south so yeah watch out for that and i think i found that on a uh i was saying i don't i don't i remember reading much in the news I, I haven't been reading much mainstream news. I'm reading uh, like uh, business specific or analytics and data specific things, which is how I came across that article. But yeah, that chart that they had where they had the breakdown of the specific number of cases, there was like, you know, some of these provinces down in Southern India had 15, 20 reported cases. And then obviously up by Milan, it's like thousands. So yeah, watch out for that. Anybody else have any other comments? Thanks for chipping in there, Alan. I appreciate it. All right. Well, if nobody else has anything else to add. I'll go ahead and call the meeting and uh, talk to you next Friday. I'm going to continue to do this every Friday as much as possible just because it's uh, a nice reprieve from work. And if anybody has any topics, send it over to me and, and I'll pick it for next week. I thought Starsky was a good topic, though. All right. Thanks, Keith. Thanks, Thank everybody. Bye-bye. Have a nice weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye.